All right, so let's go ahead and begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, as we gather this evening, please pour out your grace into our minds and hearts and help us to know you, help us to love you, help us to increase in charity through the exercise of listening to sacred teaching, to Catholic doctrine, especially as we contemplate the poor souls in purgatory and the ways in which we can assist them. This is a reading from the second book of Maccabees. Then Judas assembled his army and went to the city of Adullam. As the seventh day was coming on, they purified themselves according to the custom, and they kept the Sabbath there. On the next day, as by that time it had become necessary, Judas and his men went to take up the bodies of the fallen and to bring them back to lie with their kinsmen in the sepulchres of their fathers. Then under the tunic of every one of the dead, they found sacred tokens of the idols of Jamnia, which the law forbids the Jews to wear. And it became clear to all that this was why these men had fallen. So they all blessed the ways of the Lord, the righteous judge who reveals the things that are hidden. And they turned to prayer, beseeching that the sin which had been committed might be wholly blotted out. And the noble Judas exhorted the people to keep themselves free from sin, for they had seen with their own eyes what had happened because of the sin of those who had fallen. He also took up a collection, man by man, to the amount of 2,000 drachmas of silver, and sent it to Jerusalem to provide for a sin offering. In doing this, he acted very well and honorably, taking account of the resurrection. For if he were not expecting that those who had fallen would rise again, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. But if he was looking to the splendid reward that is laid up for those who fall asleep in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Therefore he made atonement for the dead, that they might be delivered from their sin. This is uh, one of the most important passages for discussing our Catholic practice of praying for the dead, our devotion to the poor souls in purgatory. And it's found in the second book of Maccabees. And in a way, not only does it describe what happened, but it also praises the action of this leader, uh, this um, commander of an army whose men had fallen and who offered atonement for their sins. Um, so I wanted to begin with that, trying always to see the connection between our doctrine and the scriptures, recognizing that tradition and scripture are um, two sides of the same coin. They flow out of the same source of divine revelation. So this talk tonight is called, if you can um, tolerate the pun, indulge a little this month, purgatory and praying for the dead. Um, so maybe not everyone gets the joke, but well, I suppose that's the risk of making a joke. So it's important for us in this month of November to not only make an effort to pray for the dead, to maybe some of you attended the All Souls Day Mass or, all, or Masses, but also to just delve a little bit deeper into this aspect of our faith. Why is it that we pray for the dead? What is it exactly that we believe about purgatory? And then my aim, really what I'll spend most of the time doing with this talk, is talking about how, practically speaking, to obtain an indulgence. Um, something we don't talk about often. Uh, I actually wanted to start with that. You know, why, isn't that, why is it that we don't hear more about purgatory and indulgences? And I think uh, there's a number of different reasons. Um, but just reflecting on it, I was thinking that part of it is that, well, uh, exactly the, all of the details of the souls in purgatory and their experience and what exactly their suffering is like, what exactly the passage of time is like for the souls in purgatory, for those who, are, who have died and been separated from their body but are not yet seeing the full vision of God or have not yet been purified and come into the presence of God. What is this state like? Well, we actually have very limited knowledge when you think about it. Revelation gives us to know that there is this state and condition of the church suffering, we call them, the holy souls in purgatory. But exactly how it all works is somewhat of a, a muddled picture. And I think perhaps we hesitate as Catholics to, to go into this because we are a little afraid because we can't say every detail. It's our own mechanistic age's contention to believe that, well, if you can't know everything about something, then it must not be real. 
or it must not be possible to know anything about it. It's just that that's the very definition of a mystery when it comes to the, the mysteries of the faith. An easy way to say it is that the mysteries of our Catholic faith are things that we can't know everything about, but we can still know something about. Whereas when we use the word mystery in popular discussion, we tend to say, oh, well, it's just a mystery, meaning like I can't say anything else. Whereas what we say about mysteries, any of the mysteries of the faith, especially surrounding our Lord, think of the hypostatic union, our Lord, the God-man, think of the Holy Trinity. We say, well, it's a mystery, meaning I can't say everything there is to say about it, but I still can say something. I still can profess belief in it. I still can have some purchase, some understanding. I think there's also a few historical reasons why we are a little bit shy introducing the notion of indulgences, because you, as you probably know, um, there were some practices in the Middle Ages that led to a certain reformation, as it were. Um, I believe, actually, there's a talk going on at the Josephinum right now about um, the Reformation. The difficulty of uh, explaining indulgences, too, is that well, really you need a, a forum like this. You need a, a bit more of a classroom setting. It's not something we can really handle in 10 minutes in a Sunday homily. Like, here's all there is to know about purgatory and indulgences. The other difficulty is that, uh, well, the Sunday readings don't necessarily cue us up as preachers for that. But I think the biggest reason, perhaps, is that understanding purgatory and further understanding the practice of obtaining indulgences is something that really presupposes a lot of catechesis, a lot of um, a, a kind of sound knowledge of the basics, um, an understanding of confession, an understanding of the nature of sin, uh, what it means to merit things in grace, to merit things in Christ, and what it means to make reparation for our sins and to do penance. So this I wanted to use as a very good forum, I think, especially here in the month of November. Uh, I'm not an expert on this, this subject matter, um, but I think it's important for us all to go into a little bit in depth, uh, especially in the month of November, and to kind of renew our own. Perhaps you're familiar with indulgences and even have a habit of obtaining indulgences, um, but it's important just to kind of review and to look into this. Maybe you're not familiar with it all, and that's totally fine, because it is something a little bit complex, but I still think manageable, and I have, I've boiled it down to a handout, right? So when it comes down to it, it's, it's, it's on two sides of one piece of paper that we can explain basically what you need to know in order to receive this um, extra favor from the treasury of Christ's merits. The other aspect is that, well, you don't have to do indulgences. <laughs> it's just, it's a totally optional part of the faith, right? And so I think um, this is just part of, you know, the church's wisdom in saying, okay, here is this, which is totally optional. We want to stress what's, what's mandatory, what's, what's absolutely essential, which is the ordinary means of holiness being through the sacraments. But indulgences are offered really as, okay, if you want to go deeper, if you want to especially um, engage in making reparation for your own sins and being devoted to the souls in purgatory, go this route. It's a highly recommended practice. Again, like I said, it's just going to take a little bit of time to explain it. So this is really a practical talk uh, aimed at helping you foster your own devotion to the souls in purgatory and to have a habit of praying for the dead and to contemplate something of the church suffering and our connection with them. I think indulgences we can understand especially as a way that the church gives to incentivize our spiritual life, to incentivize the, the good practices that we already are doing or ought to engage in more. There's never, there's never an indulgence for something totally random, you know, um, or even trivial, you know, go to this bookstore and buy a book. You know, that's not, <laughs> you're not going to find an indulgence for that. They're always connected to something that's already an act of devotion or piety, like visiting a church and saying certain prayers, praying the rosary in a church, uh, reading the scriptures. There are already things that are good to do that lead to our sanctification. Okay, so that's just by way of introduction. But before we can really get into what an indulgence is, um, we have to go through some of the basics. Now, we need to start really with sin. Um, we know sin is an offense against God, but I think it's not often that we reflect on what that means. 
to be an offense against God, well, any offense against the infinite and almighty God is significant and serious. Um, there's, only, there's almost something following kind of the language of Catherine of Siena and Thomas Aquinas as well. There's something quasi-infinite about our sins because they offend the infinite God. Or at least you could say something unfathomable. We don't quite know the full damage that our sins do or make. Um, we can't quite know, except in Christ, the full weight of our sins, which is part of why it's so important to have a devotion to our Lord's passion and to always be turning to the crucifix for prayer. Because it's in the crucifix, it's in our Lord on the cross, that we find especially the damage that our sins have done. And, well, we see manifest how much God loves us. Okay, so our sins offend God. They don't harm him in his divinity. Um, but, to use uh, the language of Catherine of Siena, um, our sins really harm um, God in his creatures. Or they harm the further spreading of his glory in his creation. And, you know, I think the best example, the first example to, to give us a sense of the seriousness of sin is to turn to Adam and Eve, the sin of Adam and Eve, which shows us really dramatically the effects of sin, that because of Adam and Eve's disobedience, um, their relationship with God was fundamentally changed. And basically everything else, they harmed themselves and their relationship with one another, and the, wo the world itself was wounded. Um, we see, you know, disease and sickness and natural disasters are really uh, a consequence of original sin. You can think of the book of Genesis where the Lord says, cursed be the ground because of you. Um, that's pointing us even to the, the lack of harmony that we now experience between ourselves and the world we live in. Okay, so that's Adam and Eve. We know that their sins had big consequence. But we can't put all the blame on Adam and Eve. We show our own, let's say, complicity. We're sort of accomplices, you might say, to original sin. Whenever we commit our own personal sins. Uh, when we commit our own personal sins, we, we harm our relationship with God. We harm one another, um, whether these are serious sins, mortal sins, or venial sins. And the important thing, I think, that's relevant for talking about indulgences and making up for sin is to realize that when we sin, we don't just harm those who we, like, clearly offend. You know, I speak bad about someone and hurt their reputation, or I, you know, punch someone uh, and it, it physically harms them, right? Um, that's easy enough to see. I think we all see that. But what we don't see is that there's a kind of network of spiritual solidarity that's damaged. Uh, we, in a way, harm the church by our sins, uh, even if, you know, people don't know that we committed that sin. The, the talk I gave last month on St. Catherine of Siena, one of the, I think, the take-home points from that was really the fact that St. Catherine, though she was very holy, saw herself as, um, I mean, even in her language, one of the um, chief reasons why there was so much corruption in the church. You know, though she was very holy, she felt guilty and um, truly saw herself, counted herself amongst sinners. So that's a, a kind of sensitivity to sin that I think we gain, that the saints show us as, um, as they approach God. So, okay, Adam and Eve sinned, we sin, but neither Adam and Eve, nor ourselves, nor all of humanity put together can repair the damage of sin. In fact, we know this. This is at the heart of our faith, that God became man, first and foremost, to save us from sin. He became man also to, to show us what it's like to be holy, uh, to make us partakers of divine sonship, partakers of the divine nature. But if we're to, just to put it simply, first and foremost, God became man to save us from our sins. This is why, for instance, at the Easter Vigil, when the deacon or the priest sings the exalted, he mentions the happy fault of Adam and Eve that earned for us so great a redeemer. So though Adam and Eve's sins were terrible and wounded the world, in God's providence, uh, he's drawn out tremendous good from it. He's given us a savior. So Jesus Christ was handed over in accordance with the scriptures and in fulfillment of God's plan, was crucified, died, and rose again. 
This is really the heart of our Christian claim, the heart of our faith. It's important when we think about Christ dying for us on the cross um, that we also use, you might say, several different terms to describe it. I'll just put that picture up here again. I think it's what this picture in particular brings out is that, uh, and you see this in a lot of different crucifixion scenes, is that everyone has a different reaction to Jesus on the cross. Uh, I think there's a lot that can be said by looking at the eyes of the individuals. Those who are fighting over his garments, as well as those who are very much close to him, like Mary Magdalene at his feet, or Our Lady gazing up into his eyes, John the Beloved as well. They show us something of what it means to be joined to Christ in his sufferings. So how do we talk about what Jesus did for us? Well, you're familiar with a lot of different language, just from the liturgy and just from the scriptures. I'm going to mention a bunch of different ways of talking about what Jesus did for us, and they'll be familiar to it. That, that Jesus merited our salvation, that he made satisfaction for our sins, that he offered himself up as a perfect sacrifice, that he redeemed us, and that he's the cause of our salvation. So those, it's important to use a lot of those different words because, again, approaching a mystery, we can't quite grasp it all in just a few human concepts. So we do the best we can, and we kind of use the wealth of the language that the scriptures give us. That What Jesus did was a matter of merit, a matter of satisfaction, making up for sin, a matter of sacrifice. That's, I think, um, intuitive to us as Catholics when we talk about the sacrifice of the Mass. It's really an extension of the sacrifice of the cross. Also that Christ redeemed us, that he paid the price, um, and that he is the cause of our salvation. Okay, so I'm going through all this rather quickly. I know it's a lot of information, but I, I think it's just important to lay the foundation when we talk about the way in which we also can participate in atoning for sin. So God became man so that someone from within the human race could repair the infinite damage caused by sin. So the infinite power and dignity of God um, that Christ had was able, uh, made him able to offer and to fix the damage of sin, to offer himself and fix the damage of sin. It's also worth noting, you know, that Christ suffered really greater sufferings than any human being ever had or will. And you might, you might, I don't know, think about it and say, well, okay, crucifixion's bad, but wouldn't Maybe there's some other ways that are bad to die. St. Thomas kind of directs our attention in a different way. He says, well, look at the perfection of Christ's human nature. And he had a perfect body. You know, I feel like whenever you say that, it makes it sound like he was like really fit. But, <laughs> but it means that, that um, his human nature was perfect and highly sensitive. And so the crucifixion he endured, you know, which involved the, the physical agony of being um, tortured in in very sensitive parts of the body, in his hands, and his feet, his head, his side. Think of this, uh, his, all of the scourging in his back, and of course the, our tradition of the Stations of the Cross take each of those, each of those ways our Lord was wounded, and bring out a reflection for us, um, a way to be joined to Christ. So Christ's sufferings were greater than any human being had ever experienced and ever will experience. And he also has an infinite dignity because he's God. And so because of that, what he does for us is super abundant. Super abundant. This is a word that sounds like, um, you know, a very enthusiastic friend would use. Oh, super abundant. It was super excellent. <laughs> but super abundant actually is a kind of theological word. It means that Christ went above and beyond. Um, he's more than made up for all the sins of human history before him and after him, from the beginning of time until the end. So it's important to recognize what Jesus has done um, more than makes up for any sins uh, that we have committed or will commit. I'll, I'll explain why it's just important to hold that in our heads. Okay, so why go through all this on a talk on purgatory? Well, it's because with the right understanding of Christ's sacrifice, we understand how we also are joined to him in atoning for our sins, um, that we can be purified and repair the damage left by sin. So if we're joined to Christ in our sufferings, we can participate, that's the key word really, participate in the satisfaction that he makes, through, makes for sin.
through his sacrifice. You know, he, he invites us explicitly to this in the scriptures. He asks us to pick up our crosses and follow after him, to place our sufferings, you might say, on his cross as well, to couch our sufferings within his. These are all different ways of explaining what it means to participate in Christ's suffering. I think one of the, the keys to this really is seeing the suffering of the Blessed Virgin Mary at the foot of the cross. This is another uh, fresco by Fra Angelico, but it's in the chapter room uh, where the Dominicans would gather in prayer, uh, gather for their meetings. Um, and uh, you see that Mary is not so much fainting here and being held up by, by the apostles and Mary Magdalene. It's, it's more, he's done this to highlight her conformity to Christ. She has a cruciform shape, right? She's joined to Christ in, in his suffering. And therefore is the model for us of how to participate in his suffering. You know, um, and this is where you know, we can have some Protestant apologetics and, uh, and to say, oh, well, but what Christ did was more than enough. And we say, yes, but at the same time, he invites others to join him in his suffering as a way to make up for sin. First and foremost, the Blessed Virgin Mary standing at the foot of the cross. It's interesting to look at St. Paul when he talks about filling up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. If you read the letter to the Colossians, it talks about, you know, St. Paul is striving to, and therefore we should also strive to fill up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. And you might say, okay, well, I just told you that Christ suffers more than enough for all sins, you know, at all time. How could there be anything lacking? It's super abundant what Christ does. Well, the only thing lacking, so to speak, is our participation in the sufferings of Christ, that we can uh, have an avenue to participate in his sufferings. The real, uh, this is really the place to begin uh, in talking about purgatory, because essentially when we're talking about purgatory, we're talking about atonement being made for sins. And any atonement we make for sin really needs to begin on this earth. Purgatory is just the name for that State really, um, that condition of the church suffering where they are atoning for the remaining punishment due to sin that they still have, and that those who have passed away have on their souls. We often talk about purgatory as uh, a particular place. We often talk about it as uh, in regard to time spent in purgatory. But I think it's important for us to just step back a moment and say that, okay, it's limited in what way we can say that this is a time and a place. Uh, it's, it's easiest just to say it's a state, it's a condition. I can go into more of that, but really I think it's um, what, what the, the doctrine of purgatory offers us and praying for the dead offers us is uh, a very practical element of our faith. You know, it's not about figuring out all the details of what purgatory is like. You know, we don't take tours of purgatory, but we are joined to the souls in purgatory. Um, we are joined to them in their suffering. Uh, in what we offer on their behalf. Okay, so I need to go back to sin for a second. Um, sin has a, a real, I, I said it has a, a serious consequence that we can't even really fathom completely in this life. But sin has, you might say, a double consequence because anytime we sin, there's both the guilt that we incur because we sin, but also the penalty or the punishment that that sin merits. And so traditionally we talk about this as the distinction between culpa, as in mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, guilt, culpa, and pena, which, real, which is referring to penalty or the punishment due to sin. So the guilt of our sins is forgiven through confession. Um, this is obvious, this is why we go to confession. This is, this is just intuitive to us in the practice of confession. Uh, we know that venial sins can be forgiven through other penitential practices, too. Um, serious sins can, uh, ordinarily speaking, only be forgiven through the ordinary means, which is confession. It's an entire sacrament instituted by Christ to be able to do that, which is why it's the avenue for doing that, for having serious sins forgiven. Okay, so though the guilt of sin, the culpa, is forgiven whenever we go to confession. Confession doesn't remove all the penalty or punishment that's due to sin. So we talk about the temporal punishment of sin that remains. 
Um, at the same time, you might say, well, confession jumpstarts the process to even forgive that. You know, think of doing your penance. Your penance is not only helping remove the guilt, so, but it also is a way to, to kind of jumpstart the time you would incur in purgatory from your sins, the temporal punishment due to sin. Um, so you might say confession jumpstarts a process that's really something that's meant to occupy our whole Christian life. You know, think of Lent. You know, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. It's a whole season where we kind of ratchet it up. Um, you know, you might say, <laughs> if, this, if what I just said wasn't true, then our practice wouldn't make sense. Because think about it. Well, if you're like, okay, Lent is the season we all do penance for our sins, but what if I go to confession on Ash Wednesday, my sins are forgiven, and I don't really need to do any penance because, you know, I, my sins, you know, are forgiven. Or have you ever um, gone to confession and then right away gone to Mass? And then it's the beginning of the Mass, and you say, let us call to mind our sins. And you're like, just did. <laughs> like, in fact, I just went to confession, so I'm pretty sure I'm good now. Um, what's, uh, I offer that as kind of a silly example, but it's meant to show us that there's a kind of twofold aspect to the forgiveness of our sins. Not just the guilt being forgiven, but also the punishment due to sin, which we work on long term. Um, so penance is ongoing both for ourselves and for others, the penance we do for the whole world. Um, and this brings up the point of that kind of spiritual solidarity we have with the other members of the church. Um, you know, if Adam and Eve's sin shows us anything, it should be that our actions have consequences, because they certainly did. Uh, so our sins have consequences. And, but what Christ's redemption shows us is how we can atone for sins and merit for others in Christ. Um, we can offer our merits on behalf of someone else. We can always do this. You know, uh, people often come to priests and say, I don't know what to do for so-and-so. They left the church. I can't even talk to them about God. Um, you know, I, I suspect all of us have some people like this in our lives. And, of course, we can pray for them, um, but we can also merit for them, offer sacrifices for them. That's just a general point. Talking about the souls in purgatory, it gets a little more specific here because we can offer our penance, our atonement for sin, again for ourselves, but even for those, extending that solidarity of the church, of the communion of saints, even to those who've passed away. Um, if you think about it, um, we as the church militant, uh, as Catholics here on earth, as Christians here on earth, we have something that that others don't, that something that even the saints in heaven don't have. And that's the opportunity to be able to merit, the opportunity to increase in charity each day. You know? So if you think of like the three big sections of the church, the saints in heaven, the souls in purgatory, and us here on earth. Um, you know, the souls in purgatory are really counting on us <laughs> because we can offer um, acts of reparation. You know. Um, the clock hasn't expired yet. You know, we have, until we breathe our last breath, are capable of increasing in charity, of offering acts of charity, of meriting for others in a way that even the saints can't at the moment. They can intercede, but their life is ended. They attained the level of charity that they attained with their death. Um, and, you know, and that's kind of the, the end of their opportunity. Yes, they're happy with God in heaven, but, you know, I think... What all of this teaching helps us do is to really appreciate um, our time on this earth and to recognize that each day counts, every moment counts. You know? Um, you know, if the saints in heaven had a message for us or have a message for us, it's that, well, every day counts. Um, Charity is what matters. It's the thing you get to take up here with us. You know? Charity is what matters. We build up treasure in heaven. And the souls in purgatory look at us even more longingly and say, look, now's the time. Um, now is the time to offer reparation uh, because you can do it in a meritorious way here and now on earth. Um, so uh, really here and now is the best time to offer reparation for our sins. You know, we're going to have to kind of drink the cup to its dregs and suffer uh, for all of the punishment that um, we have incurred in justice. We're going to have to one way or another, but here and now is the best time to, um, because we have more resources. And when we offer our penances here and now, 
we can also increase in charity, which is, again, really the reason God gives any of us more days on this earth is so that we can grow in charity. It's, the, it's, it's what we get to take with us to heaven. Okay. So beginning to kind of apply this a little bit more practically. I think all too often we jump just right into talking about purgatory as a place um, and don't necessarily think about the reason for its existence. So that's kind of why I've laid things out the way I have. Um, we know, you know, not everyone dies ready to see God. They need that time of purification, time to get rid of the remainder of the punishment um, that they have incurred. So we can offer our merits for the poor souls in purgatory. What does that look like? Well, we can pray for them. We can sacrifice for them. We can have masses offered for them, one of the best things that we can do. Um, in fact, the doctrine of purgatory, really, we, we see it in its earliest form in the fact that Christians, even very early on, even the earliest of Eucharistic prayers, are praying for the dead, praying for the dead at the Mass, showing the faith in the power of the Eucharist, um, that the Eucharist um, has the power to change the relationship um, of the souls in purgatory with God, has the power to hasten their time in coming to, coming to see God. So every, every Eucharistic prayer that we can use, for instance, in the liturgy we have now, mentions the dead. So we pray for them, we sacrifice for them, have Masses offered for them, remember them at Mass. Um, you know, even, uh, for instance, with Eucharistic Prayer 1, the priest is supposed to close his hands, you know, uh, remember also your servants who have gone before us. And there's even the little spot in there for the priest to say so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so, if that Mass is being offered for a particular deceased person. But often, you know, it's a custom of priests, I think to St. Maximilian Kolbe, um, who would keep a list of the living folks he wanted to pray for and of the dead. And he would deliberately pause at those moments in the Mass and call to mind, as many priests do, I mean, I think literally like, okay, who do I know that's died recently? <laughs> like, uh, no, you only have a few seconds there. But it's just good to be mindful for all of us when we go to the Eucharist to pray for the living and the dead. Uh, this day in particular, it's good to have this talk on this day, is the day the Dominican Order celebrates, or I should say commemorates, all of the deceased Dominicans. Uh, so it's all Dominican souls, you could say. We get to have our own extra feast. Um, so all Dominican souls, praying for all of those friars who have gone before us. Um, okay, I think that's uh, a good foundation about act offering reparation and about purgatory in general. But I really do want to spend a lot of time on indulgences because I think, frankly, we don't talk about them enough. Um, Okay, so what are indulgences? I don't have a picture. I wish I had a picture of an indulgence, but it doesn't work that way. Here, we'll do another, another for Angelico. What is an indulgence? Well, it's a particular favor granted by the church out of the treasury, that superabundant treasury of the merits of Christ and the saints, to remit, that is, take away punishment due to sin. It sounds rather legal, right? It's funny, when you, as soon as you start talking about indulgences, it's like, it's like as though canon law uh, is like colliding with the devotional life, you know, which, you know, they're never truly separate. But it's, uh, it's kind of funny because you begin using language that sounds very technical or even legal. But it's important, and it's actually not that confusing. Um, so... An indulgence is uh, something that we can obtain either for ourselves or for someone who's died. So for ourselves individually or for someone who has died. Um, or we can just intend, well, give this to, to anyone down there in purgatory, right? Now notice who's missing in this. We can't apply or obtain an indulgence for another person who's still alive, right? We can't say, well... I'm going to offer an indulgence so that my spouse doesn't spend any time in purgatory, if your spouse is alive, for instance. Now, why? We could step back and ask a question there. Well, think about it this way, is that they're still in a position to help themselves. You know? um, the clock hasn't run out. You know? They're still in a position to help themselves. And, and in a way, I think the, one of the points I want to leave you with is that to do an indulgence is already to be drawn in to the most important aspects of the faith. You know, you kind of have to have those bases covered first before the indulgence will really even work. 
Um, you have to have the basics uh, of mass and confession covered. Um, okay. So the catechism actually speaks of indulgences just after, within, talking about the sacrament of confession, which I think is very important. It shows us something. Why put indulgences there uh, in the section on confession? Well, it's, it's, it's to show us that they, they are interwoven. In fact, to really obtain an indulgence, one needs to go to confession. Okay, how does one obtain an indulgence? Um, well, it's by performing some action. Like I said, actions that really are already things that help us become holy. It typically involves some prayer, such as praying the rosary, or some action like reading the scriptures, doing the Stations of the Cross, visiting a cemetery, uh, between November 1st and November 8th. So I think our time's up for this year, unless you're gonna go out to a cemetery tonight, which sounds kind of creepy. <laughs> so it's some kind of action, um, and it may have a kind of physical element to it, actually like a, a small pilgrimage to a church on its feast day. Or uh, it may involve using religious articles or going, um, yeah, or actually going to a place. So this is the first thing to notice, that the church offers us a share in the treasury of the merits of Christ and the saints, but only within the specific context that, well, really is us already taking advantage of the ordinary means of becoming holy, already doing something that's just plain good to do on its own. Um, here's an analogy to leave you with. I have two analogies. I think they help. Um, for instance, uh, it's like when a doctor is going to prescribe you a medicine. You know, the doctor agrees to prescribe you, let's say, a pill to lower your cholesterol or do whatever else, but only as long as you also adjust your diet and exercise, you know, change your lifestyle in some degree, do the right thing. So you might say that it's actually the healthy eating and exercise that's the kind of first medicine and the most important one. Um, so likewise with indulgences, it's, it's actually repenting of our sins, being sorry for our sins, going to confession and doing acts of penance, acts that are already meritorious, that's like the first medicine. That's the, the healthy diet and exercise. Um, because in this case, well, frankly, the medicine simply won't work and indulgence simply won't work unless we're already doing the things um, that are lined out, that are, that are set out for us. Now, here's where someone might say, well, if the church has this access to a treasury of merits of Christ and the saints, why doesn't the church just give it out to everyone all the time, you know, with the simplest of actions, you know? Why doesn't the church just say, well, if you say the name of Jesus once, then all of the time that you would spend in purgatory will be taken away? Um, well, why doesn't the church do this? Well, it would be kind of irresponsible um, because in a way you need to have the basics first before an indulgence will really even work. You need to be plugged into confession in the Eucharist. So be irresponsible and wouldn't even make light of our sins if we were to get indulgences without even having any skin in the game, you might say. The practice um, that we do, the, the act of piety that we do, um, the grant that we exercise in the indulgence, it needs to cost us something, whether a little bit of time, um, or at least some motion of our mind and heart up to God. It may not seem like much, but that is, that is something. So, you know, you, you wouldn't really trust a doctor who just goes out writing prescriptions, you know, saying, you know, this medicine will help you. I don't even need to examine you, you know. Mm -hmm. It helps everybody, you know. And if, you know, it, wouldn't, it won't hurt you even if you don't need it. You know? That would be a little bit irresponsible on the doctor's part. Okay, the other analogy for, I think, understanding indulgences that helps us is that of a kind of matching grant. <laughs> We're used to hearing, for instance, with fundraising projects within the church, not just within the church, that an anonymous benefactor has donated $200,000 um, so that any gift you give will be matched dollar to dollar up to $200,000, for instance. You no, know, this is something we're used to hearing. Um, and I bring that up not because, well, this is a monetary thing, uh, the treasury of the church's merits. This has nothing to do with money. Rather, I bring this up because it helps us understand the motivation of talking about indulgences. Why do we have matching gift campaigns in fundraising? Why would a, 
a benefactor give a large sum in this way? Well, it's to encourage others to give. It's to encourage involvement on others, you know, to think that, well, every dollar they spend will be, uh, or donate, will be $2 uh, in power, $2 in effectiveness. So in the same way, the church encourages us with the merits of Christ, Mary, and the saints to atone for sins and to do our part. You know, we need encouragement, don't we, right? We think especially... Um, about the damage our sins have caused, or we feel weighed down by our sins, even eclipsed by them, uh, as though we could never begin to make atonement for our sins. But what uh, the teaching about indulgences shows us, and the way the church makes indulgences available to us, is, well, um, we can do a lot. And especially we want to use our time in this life uh, and take advantage of these opportunities. Now, this uh, comparison to money might make some people a little nervous, but it shouldn't because it's not like we're talking about buying or selling anything spiritual here. And any abuse of indulgences in this regard that has taken place has been corrected in, through the centuries. Also, the scriptures use a kind of money image to talk of paying the debt of our sins. Um, there's, a, I think it's in Proverbs, a beautiful line that giving to the poor is like having God take a loan out from us, you know, that will be repaid in our proper time. Uh, that's, there's really a, a whole spiritual meditation that you could offer uh, going through the scriptures and that theme. Gary Anderson is big on that, the Bible scholar at Notre Dame. He has a book just called Sin, which sounds interesting, um, and a book called Charity. I think it's the book called Charity that, that has this theme, if you're interested in that. They're very, they're, they're approachable books. Um, also, we know that our Lord stresses that the literal giving of money to the poor as a form of penance, um, almsgiving uh, as a form of penance, one of the most important, uh, one of the three, I should say. Okay, so what I really want to <laughs> recommend that you do, if you're interested in learning more about indulgences, is to read a short document by Paul VI, now we call St. Paul VI, as of last month, uh, St. Paul VI kind of revised the practice of indulgences with a new document uh, in the 60s called Indulgentiarum Doctrina, which just means the doctrine of indulgences. That's the first, as all the papal documents, that's just the first two words. Um, so you can look it up online. Just Google Paul VI indulgences document. Um, you'll find it. And also, I really encourage you to buy the Handbook of Indulgences. Um, this is the third edition. But the fourth edition is now out, which would be the one you want to get. Um, just, it's called the Manual of Indulgences, actually. Uh, the Manual of Indulgences. Um, and it's important to have, not only because it explains indulgences, but because um, it lists all of the different ones. You know? So it's almost like a prayer book, because it has the prayers here. You know? um, it's a prayer book with a little more you know, scavenger hunt style instructions. <laughs> um, to go to this church on a feast day, for instance. That's one of the, the, on the feast day of that church. That's one indulgence. Okay, I need to say just one more thing about the two different types of indulgences uh, before I go through the practicals of how to do indulgences. And I'm realizing I'm already kind of getting closer to time. Um, that's why I made a handout. Um, so plenary versus partial indulgences. What's called a plenary or full just a fancy Latinate word for full. A full indulgence removes all of the temporal punishment due to sin. And it's pretty amazing when you think about it. And, you know, it's more than just a matching gift that the church offers us from the treasury of merits of Christ. It takes away all of the time that we would uh, spend for having uh, committed our sins, uh, the temporal punishment due to sin um, that we would otherwise spend in purgatory. So... One of the uh, things that Paul VI did was reduce the number of plenary indulgences to kind of highlight that it's significant and special. And so there's actually four different types of plenary indulgences that you can just get on any day. And they're pretty, they're pretty modest uh, when you think about it. They're not, you don't have to take a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, you know. Now, a partial indulgence is just some smaller work that we do that takes away some time, we don't know how much exactly, some of the temporal punishment due to sin. Okay, so I have a handout for you here. Um, someone might help me. Uh, okay. Okay.
Yeah, it has the same header, but it is two different pages. OK, so we'll just start with the example of a plenary indulgence. How do I get a plenary indulgence? How do I obtain a plenary indulgence? Well, we pre perform some work um, that has a plenary indulgence attached to it. And the, the four that you can get at any time, any day, to pray in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament for 30 minutes, to do adoration for 30 minutes. It doesn't have to be with exposition. You can just be in the church with the tabernacle. Or to read scripture for 30 minutes, devoutly read scripture for 30 minutes one day. Or to pray the rosary in a church or with your family or another pious group. So it's not just praying the rosary on your own walking outside, but to pray the rosary in a church or with a group. If it's with a, church, with a group in a church, even better. Or to do the Stations of the Cross. Um, so those are examples of four that, that you could do at any time. And there's three really main conditions, um, other things that you need to do. The first is to receive Holy Communion. Uh, and ideally on that same day that you do the action. Um, and also you want to pray for the Pope's intentions. There's a little bit of repetition here. I just now see a typo. But, uh, so the second one is to go to confession several days before or after performing the work. And a single confession suffices for gaining many indulgences, right? Um, so it says, that the handbook, you know, the document said several days before or several days after you do that special act. Uh, and so later on it's asked, well, how many is several, right? We, we always want to know precisely. And in a, in a document um, for the Jubilee year by John Paul II, it was somewhat clarified indirectly that several is 20, <laughs> uh, which is a lot more than I would think, right? Um, the bottom line, so that's all a long way of explaining, if you want to be able to do a plenary indulgence even every day, if you go to confession once a month, that's more than enough. Um, so that's often enough to be able to have this kind of condition satisfied. OK, the other thing, and I think this is really the thing that um, we have to, have to really remember to, to be able to do the indulgence, is to pray for the Pope's intentions. And the example here is to, to pray in Our Father and in Hail Mary, or really any other prayer for the Pope's intentions. You could pray the St. Michael, the Archangel prayer for the Pope. Um, you, could, you could pray the morning offering, I believe, for the Pope. It really gives you a lot of flexibility there. OK, so those are kind of like the three main conditions. But I put a bunch of other things in here um, that are just also important to be mindful of. So you also need to intend to do the indulgence. This is why I wanted to take the trouble to talk about them, because I think a lot of people are doing these things already, but don't necessarily even know that they're indulgences. I mean, when you read through the handbook of indulgences, it reads a bit like an ordinary prayer book. There's a lot of prayers that, you'll, that you already have memorized even in here. It's just good to know that those also count as indulgence uh, grants. Um, also, we need to be in the state of grace, at least at the time the work is completed. Um, so, And now this is perhaps the most difficult condition, but to be completely detached from sin, even venial sin. Um, now, some people get hung, been out of shape on this. I think it's important just to recognize this isn't asking us to stop committing venial sins altogether, right? There are the sins of weakness that catch us off guard each day. The righteous man sins seven times a day. And St. Thomas would maintain that, for instance, in this life, no one can be completely free of venial sin. I think what this really refers to is a kind of settled attachment to venial sin. You know, the sin that we just never put up any resistance to, we know we're going to commit, and we kind of know even when we wake up in the morning we're going we're to commit. Um, not just like it's likely that we will, but something that we haven't really renounced is another way to say it. We, I can talk more about that one, but it's, it's open to interpretation. But some things to keep in mind here is that the indulgence can be applied either to yourself or to someone who has died. And you can only obtain one plenary indulgence a day, but you can obtain many partial indulgences. Except, this is kind of, I think, almost humorous, it says, specifies, Except on the day you die, you can get two plenary indulgences. And I think that's about the last thing you're going to be thinking about as you're dying. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. I think maybe we can, um, we can really be habituated to this and, uh, and to have that as be a part of our own prayer life. But the other thing is that at the hour of your death, usually connected with anointing of the sick or confession, the priest can give you the apostolic pardon, which is itself a plenary indulgence. Um, and so, you know, we as priests make a habit if someone is 
near death of giving that apostolic pardon. Um, now, here's the kind of consolation prize, that very last bullet point there. If you fail to do one of the three main conditions, or you're still attached to sin, for instance, you, you don't have the proper disposition, you can still obtain a partial indulgence. It kind of levels down. And so I have there, as the second part, what it means to do a partial indulgence. And this is the one where you have all kinds of things listed. You'll find all kinds of things listed. If you look on the back, I just give you some examples of these prayers that have partial indulgences attached to them. I think uh, it's implied, though, that we need to shoot for doing the main three conditions as well with partial indulgences. And then now if you flip over, it says, again, also you have to intend to do it and to be in the state of grace. So you can see, like, it's like the same conditions as the plenary indulgence, but just taken down a notch or two. Um, so I think that's important to just kind of know the nuts and bolts of. Um, also, with uh, Paul VI's document, uh, if you look in the middle of the page here on the handout, it says plenary indulgence is available on any day. Oh, I'm sorry, general types of grants at the top there, general types of grants. Raising our minds throughout the course of our daily work and difficulties, even just saying short prayers. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, Mary, I love you. Help me. Short prayers like that can have indulgences attached to them. I think they can be very meritorious, right? Because it's difficult to pray in the course of our daily work. We, get, we, we often are not mindful of God. Also, uh, serving others. This is, again, these are very broad. They catch a lot of things. And it's a lot of things you're probably already doing. Devoting yourself for your goods and service to brothers and sisters in need. Or abstaining from something that obviously is not already sinful. Um, abstaining from some licit or, and pleasing good. Um, so I guess if you don't like broccoli, broccoli doesn't count. You know, that's the idea. Um, so someone might, I have a few comments here on, that are sort of to the effect of why care. Someone might say, well, this is all really complicated. I'm just trying to get to heaven. I don't want to be bogged down in all of this detail. But that's just it. This is, this is something that encourages us in things that are already good. Um, and I think we can kind of appropriate it little by little. It's just good to be aware of. Like I said, good to read the document. Good to see what some of the examples of indulgence grants are. And it can really be a help. It's not a hindrance to, to our spiritual life, but it can really be a help. Uh, because it gives us incentive to do what are already the most important practices and to train us in regular recourse to the sacraments and the practice of other, other devotions. Um, now, at the same time, you want to just, I think, have a humble recognition that, you know, we're never really going to know, okay, did I do an indulgence in that? You know, did I, did I satisfy all the conditions? Like, we can't get really hung up on that because, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that are uncertain to us. Our self-knowledge as human beings is very poor and limited and something in a way only God reveals to us bit by bit. Um, so I just encourage you to, to maybe think about getting started in doing indulgences by just uh, looking at the things that you already do uh, and intending them as indulgences. Now, you need to, you need to look at the examples and the, and the book and the list you know, online to know what those are. But I think the thing that most of us need to be more deliberate about in order to, to get the indulgences to intend to do it and to pray for the Holy Father, and then, of course, continue to make regular recourse to confession and to go to communion. Um, I mean, it seems complicated. Um, there are a lot of parts, but frankly, I started learning about this in high school because there was some zealous priest who thought, I can even get high school students to do this. And he even created a Lenten group that, um, you know, basically they went through and did one of the plenary indulgences. They did. Um, they did each of them over the course of a week. Before school, they would have adoration for 30 minutes one day. They would have scripture reading for 30 minutes one day. They would have stations of the cross one day. And they would pray the rosary together one day. And that, he thought, really was, uh, you know, this is just what indulgences are. It's the church showing us here are good practices that lead to holiness. So do them. And, and you know, we'll match the gift of merit. And more than that, um, the, you know, the treasury of Christ's merits is, is opened up to us. Uh, I think it's also good just to have some variety, to, to know what the different prayers are. and to, it, It's an, a good incentive to learn more devotional prayers and to make them a part of our regular prayer life. Um, so um, 
That's a lot of information, but uh, like I said, you have the handout. Um, let's go ahead and pause, uh, just take a quick break, and then come back for questions. Anyway, um, so we have this time for questions. Um, the microphone is for the sake of the recording that will go online. Um, so it's not, you won't hear yourself on the microphone, but if you could just wait until you have it in your hands to ask a question. But go ahead. I got about a dozen questions. <laughs> <laughs> you want to get us started? Okay, uh, How about two? I'll tell myself the dogs here. Um, I, 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 all right, there are, a lot of it sounds legalistic, okay? Legalistic? No. Legalistic. Legalistic, okay. sorry. You know, it, it's, it sounds like formulas in a sense, okay? And, you know, the church and its authority has the power to release and to bind and all that mm -hmm. good stuff. So I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm respectful of that, all mm -hmm. right? Um, and given such... Rest, you know, and indulgences were really meant to be a, a form of restitution, uh, for for you know, to in a sense to appease a just God, and also to get us back on track mm -hmm. into charity, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that that was that was you know, it's like a, like penance, whatever, like even for for confession. Okay, the point, the mm -hmm. question is, in terms of purgatory, I I know this this sounds awfully. Well, here we go. How do we know who is there in purgatory, mm -hmm. and how how can we gauge the need for prayer? Like my father passed away eleven years ago. Mm -hmm. He wasn't perfect, okay, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know anybody who is. Yeah. But you know, there are other people that, you know, you can kind of tell that there's like a a degree of holiness in sure. their lives. But even so, even those folks, you don't know where they've you know dropped the ball, so to speak. And you know, but my question is how mm -hmm. how do we know who is there and if and how do we know who we're supposed to pray for and mm -hmm. how many prayers get a loved one out? Yeah. You know, I mean you could you could be there the rest of your life praying for someone and, and not really know if in fact your yeah. prayers prayers are effective. So it's kinda like like you know, you talk about the mystery of it all. Mm -hmm. You know, we pray in the spirit of the mystery mm -hmm. and that's cool. Uh so those are those are two questions. You yeah. said I could have two. That's great. <laughs> All right. No, that's a great right. set of questions. Yeah, and I think, in fact, probably the questions on a lot of people's minds and like the next logical question, really, after learning about this. And I think that's where we just come back to a really important point with regard to Revelation, that Scripture and tradition give us everything we need to know concerning salvation and to be saved, but not necessarily everything we need to know to satisfy our curiosity, uh, or you might say our legitimate curiosity, you know, I would like to know whether so and so is in heaven yet. Um, I think we just need to have the practical kind of, you know, how does God work this out? Well, okay, if I pray for someone who's died, and they're already in heaven, it's not like it gets wasted, you know, <laughs> um, that and, you know, there's something about this, too, in the Marian consecration. Um, a, n a number of people, I'm sure, are familiar with the Marian consecration, where there's a, a kind of attitude. You're like, okay, I put Mary in charge of, like, all of my merits, you know. Um, even if you're not doing that, it's just nice to, um, to kind of have an openness. Like, God's going to make of something out of this, out of everything I offer. And it's true. We don't, you know, the bell doesn't ring, you know. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, not that anyone becomes an angel. Let's just be clear. It's a Wonderful Life is not a good source of theology. There's no really external sign. The only one being, of course, when there are verifiable miracles that occur that show that someone is, um, you know, it's the, the whole process for canonization, for instance. Those are, you know, so the church actually um, makes um, very modest claims. You know, we only know that certain people are in heaven because of evident miracles. The, so that's a whole thing with the process of canonization. Who's, who's in purgatory? We don't know. Um, we can't say exactly. You know, we can say what it means. Um, we, that Revelation gives us to know what we need, to know what it means to get to heaven. Um, but to be able to kind of you know, put an antenna out and say who's exactly in purgatory, it's just really not our place. And I think that's meant to give us kind of humility in the way we approach all of this. That 
There are certain things that, you know, God doesn't give us to know, and, well, that's okay. It would be we, simple if you could put a beeper on everybody that gets in. Yeah. When they're out, you know, you, you know, you know yeah. the story is, it's not really that clear, is it? Yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So we have to have a kind of humility, I think, in, in saying our knowledge is limited um, and see all that all within God's providence. There's a reason he doesn't tell us every detail to everything, you know. Um, frankly, um, knowing us, we would probably get bogged down in the details and actually miss the essence of our salvation, which we find in Christ and the means of our salvation we find through the sacraments, you know. These are great questions. Other questions? Maybe those start prompted some others. We can come back for your others, but I want to see. If... Oh, I didn't. Can I just pause for a second? I didn't answer the legalistic aspect. Um, so law is something an institution has um, in order to, to govern, right? In order to have a right relationship, ensure justice is preserved. So... Um, is it true that people can get overly hung up and become legalistic in their outlook? Yes, but that doesn't mean law of itself um, and certain, you know, rules <laughs> is a bad thing, you know. In fact, uh, it's the same thing, like when people say politics, think of the word politics and, and how politicians even say, well, I'm not going to be just politicking, you know. It's like, then what are you doing, you know? <laughs> politics is, is not an intrinsically evil thing. It's just what happens when you have more than one person and you need to do things together. Um, understood in the broadest sense, politics is just something that's a consequence of there being more than one person to get along in life, right? And the same thing we could say with law. Law comes about in order to govern society. So for instance, the code of canon law is actually kind of a miraculous when you think about it, um, or at least something to be appreciated that the church though it's an institution of a billion people spread throughout the entire world, is governed really by one basic legal bo book, you know, the Code of Canon Law. Now there's a lot of extra things here and there, but it's really quite amazing that, um, you know, because the church is a society, because it has people, um, there need to also be rules, uh, and they really in a way flow from revelation, from what the Lord has, has shown us through scripture and tradition. So anyway, that's another general point about legalism. Thanks for being patient. Um, I'm just wondering about when you have mass said for someone mm -hmm. who's died and how that fits in here. Yeah. Um, so that's not itself an indulgence. I would, I think we should, um, yeah, how to characterize it exactly? Like how it measures up against offering an indulgence for someone. I haven't thought about that so deeply. I just know that having mass is said for someone is basically the greatest thing that we can do for the, for the dead um, because the Mass is so powerful. Um, so it's really, um, you know, it, it's, it's part, partly we're entering into the mysteries to have um, the merits of Christ's sacrifice through its representation in this sacramental way, uh, in an unbloody sacramental way, um, the Mass is just the cross extended through time so that we can all participate in it. Uh, but also the merits of that individual Mass, uh, when the priest celebrant applies it to that intention, does something for that person, you know, whether they're living or deceased. It's all a way of saying it's really powerful for people, um, which is why we have this tradition, uh, this custom, especially of having Masses offered for the dead. I don't know quite what else we really can say about it, but um, it's very important, and I'm glad you brought it up. I don't know if I misunderstood or not, but did you say that you can or cannot gain a plenary indulgence, or indulgence for numerous people at the same time doing the same action? For instance, today with the Dominicans, oh. I'm thinking, you know, the dead mm -hmm. brothers and sisters of the Dominicans, but all I, ha I have a great big list. <laughs> and okay, am I going to dole one out per day or do I, yeah. can I be rest assured that I'm praying for all those people? Um. So the short answer is no. Well, plenary indulgence just applies to one person, you know. Um, and so, but we can offer all kinds of, but indulgences aren't the only ways that we can help the dead, you know. It's more, it's the way in which we get 
the thing we're doing to help the dead already added uh, an extra power to it through the treasury of the merits of the church. So I think it's important, like, for instance, practically speaking, well, to pray for all of the dead. But when it comes to doing an indulgence, you know, if you have a list of those who've passed away, um, who you want to be devoted to as, as the holy souls, then maybe you can even just go down the line, you know, um, and say, well, I intend this person in particular, this person in particular. I think it's important, too, especially after someone passes away. I mean, that's probably, practically speaking, the only thing I do, really, by way of having a system for it, is just, I, I'm especially mindful when someone's passed away to offer an indulgence for them in the, the following days. Um, so I think at a certain level, we just have to kind of, like, not get neurotic. <laughs> I'm not saying that's what, that's what that is. But like I said, because there's a lot of details, it's easy to get bent out of shape. It's just important to recognize that our knowledge is limited, you know. So that's a great question. Just have a follow-up. Please. For the example I gave you about mm-hmm. while well, I attended your mass this morning, you were speaking about the mm-hmm. praying for all the all the Dominicans that ever died. Okay. Yeah. So they, in that sense, when we prayed for them mm-hmm. in the rosary, we did mention that in the rosary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did they all just get partial indulgence? Well, so that's different than an indulgence. That's um, maybe I should have stressed this more. Oh. Um, well, again, to, in, in order to get an indulgence, you would need to intend to do the indulgence, uh, and that you can apply it to yourself or to someone that's died, um, but only one person. Um, so um, that's kind of the way it works out. But maybe I should have distinguished two things. There's all kinds of things we can do for the dead. You know, any acts of reparation or prayers that we can offer for them, sacrifices we can offer for them. I'm doing this for the Holy Souls in Purgatory. I'm even doing it for this particular soul in Purgatory. And indulgence applies to uh, something specific that the church has, has named and called out as a practice that can receive an indulgence grant. And so um, you can offer and intend that in particular. So there's all kinds of things we can do for the dead. Indulgence refers to that particular action by which the church kind of doubles our efforts and even more than doubles our efforts um, out of the treasury of the merits of Christ and the saints. So. My question is about purgatory. Mm-hmm. Not all religions believe in purgatory. Mm-hmm. The, the scripture that you led with from Maccabees, mm-hmm. is that a ref, the scriptural reference we can use to confirm like the, exi- the existence of purgatory? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, exactly. It's one of the most explicit. It's not the only one. There's a lot that you can say, uh, even from the prophets, um, and even from our Lord himself in the Gospels. But this is, this is the most explicit reference to someone praying for the dead and that being commended. Um, now, unfortunately, this is a book of the Bible that is not listed in all Christians' um, biblical list, you know, um, for various reasons. You know, there's, there's historical reasons why, for instance, Luther excluded certain books, uh, certain of the seven, bo- uh, seven books that have, have been called by Protestants the apocryphal books, um, which is kind of a misleading term because there's all sorts of apocryphal books, like the Gospel of St. Thomas and all of that. Um, sometimes they're called the deuterocanonical books, meaning a secondary canon. Um, but we, even as, as Catholics, we really shouldn't be using that word necessarily even, too. It's just, here's the canon. There's, everything is scripture. Uh, everything listed in the canon is scripture. The scripture came to be as a collective um, list, not because it was all published in one book, eventually, by the, by the apostles. No, Peter, copyright, uh, 72 um, AD. Um, so... The reason the canon came to be is really through uh, the working of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church, that these were the books that were read in the liturgy. These were the books deemed suitable to be proclaimed in connection with the offering of the Eucharist. And really there's a kind of um, convergence of this uh, over the first several centuries of the church. It wasn't the most important issue actually in the early church. It was more, okay, what's, how do we understand Christ? You know, how do we understand his sacrifice? How do we understand uh, his divine and human natures and the way they interact? Those were the first issues and like being persecuted that the Christians had to figure out. 
Um, it wasn't until Christianity is legalized, and they have kind of like the luxury <laughs> to step back and think in a more speculative way about what are the exact lists of inspired books. Um, but that, so anyway, I went off on the canon for a little while there. Um, but there, in, in other words, there's a lot of scriptural passages that can be used in support of the doctrine of purgatory. But I think, again, it's important to see things in terms of scripture and tradition. You know, the, there are two aspects of revelation. God has revealed to us everything he wanted us to know in his son, Jesus Christ. And that is communicated to us both through the spoken words of Jesus, because we're creatures that listen with our ears, but also through the written word of scripture, uh, because we read. And that's another mode of human communication. Uh, so th there are kind of twofold aspects that go together, which is to say that um, just because something's not in the Bible doesn't mean it's not part of God's revelation. Now, something needs to have a kind of anchoring in the Bible, and we find that, but scripture and tradition should always be seen together um, as working together, uh, flowing out from the same source and converging and coming together as the words of uh, Vatican II. Um, so that's a great question about where do we find it. Coming from the same store. Same source and Christ himself. Same source, yeah. Yeah. same treasury, if you will. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I have uh, two. two. Mm -hmm. one, one of the things that brought me here this evening was the bulletin mm -hmm. and visit a cemetery. The legalistic part is like uh, the indulgence was available from the first to the eighth. Mm -hmm. So if you went tomorrow, it didn't count well. <laughs> it just seems... I might need to you see it. It seems a little trivial. Yeah. Like, like, I just missed it. Well, I believe it's that, like, is God binding us to a week? Um, you know what I mean? It's, so it's, it's just, just important to recognize that those, those kind of practices are always good, and, and God's always doing, doing something with it. it. At the same time, in the church's role as distributing the merits of Christ, there need to be, like, actual... You know, it has to be specific in some way, or else how do we know we've done it? So there have to be some kind of guidelines. Now, that one in particular I should look up because they're um, on other days of the year, this indulgence is a partial one. So, okay. so, and I think that's where you never quite know. There's one thing I forgot to say in the talk, and this is some of you may um, have heard of an earlier time when there were specific days listed for like how many days out of purgatory this indulgence gets. Like you might find an old prayer card too that says if you pray this prayer, that's 300 days indulgence. The days was never meant to be, signify like a, like it, it's hard for us to even conceive of time in purgatory. So it's not meant to be taken in a hyper strict sense. That practice of referring to things in, in terms of days was done away with with Paul the Sixth document. And something very beautiful was brought out in its place, which is to say that how powerful is a partial indulgence? How do we answer that question? Well, it has to do with the charity with which we perform the act and the perfection with which we perform the act. So to go to a cemetery in faith, praying for the dead, making that sacrifice of going to visit their tombs, um, that's something that God looks upon and does something with. You know, it's an act of faith. So I think we need to see God at work in that and not be like, get so hung up on, you know, does this one count to this full level and all of that, you know? So. And the the yep. other question um, was mentioned earlier about the different um, faith beliefs that brought us to mm -hmm. not subscribe to purgatory. Mm -hmm. time mm. and if you pray for him now or however long you want to pray for him that God can still you know hear your prayers and, mm -hmm. and they will be mer meritous so mm -hmm. anyway I didn't know yeah. that was yep. that was the best way I thought to answer his mm -hmm. question because I thought I'm not going to go into right. all of this right. but. and uh, no, no I, think I think that was a very good way to answer the other thing is just to and you bring up a very good point which is this this gives us a deeper connection 
to those who have passed away. In some ways, it answers to our human need to mourn and to do something, right? Um, that's not the reason it exists, you know, this, these practices and all that. It's not just about our sentiments, you know. But it does give us a way to concretize our devotion to the dead, you know. Rather than just say, well, he's gone, you know, what, what can I do? Um, there's something very human about being able to help the dead, you know. Well, it was the aspect of whether he was saved or not. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And we don't know that. Right. And it's a, but you can, can, you, you can continue to pray for him. And, yeah. Uh, anyway, it seemed to yeah. help him, I think. Good. Yeah. Sure. Can you just someone else? I really appreciated what you said about, in a sense, we and you in tandem that we really can't limit God in human time, if you will, and in in human dimensions, if you will. Um, it seems that with all of this, mm -hmm. we talk about the legalism of of uh, eight days and this or that. That if any of these things might be a a problem that we pray for the leading of the Holy Spirit, um, that this doesn't that that this practice, if you want to call it that, these things don't be don't become um, legal practices. You know, practices have their place. Confession has its place. That when I'm given rest, given a penance of some kind, mm -hmm. whether it's whether it's a, rest, a form of restitution, if some, if I kill the man who had wife and children, it's incumbent upon me to take care of that wife and children, the wife, you know, the, the wife mm -hmm. and, and those children too. That would be to me a very fair, mm -hmm. uh, and call it indulgence, call it a penance, call it whatever, uh, for me to bring restitution of some kind mm -hmm. and justice mm -hmm. with a sorrowful heart. And to want to help that woman and child after something I something that I did that was terrible, mm -hmm. if that was the case. Mm -hmm. But the, the leading of the Holy Spirit in these things seems to be, you know, like where is? I mean, I have a problem with the with the term of in, in James about good works. Okay, yeah. I don't like that. Paul made a mistake. All right, <laughs> what? <laughs> but but my my meaning is that at good works in love. You know that these, like what well, Teresa's, the Teresa's, all the Teresa's yeah. talk about yeah. doing good, doing good works with yeah. small acts of love. Okay, the great was you know small things with great sure. love, and and it, it, it seems that this is also part of you know we love our are those who have gone before us, mm -hmm. and to pray for them is is an act of love. Mm -hmm. It all goes back to love, doesn't it? And charity. Yeah. Am I wrong? Yeah. Faith working in love. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Well, I would just say that um, we never want to oppose faith and works as kind of rivals, right? God's given us a mind and a heart, and he elevates both of those in grace as a matter of faith and charity. So we receive both the Son, divine wisdom in our minds, and the Holy Spirit, uh, living flame of love in our hearts. And that spills over into action for our neighbor. So we never want to oppose those two. And when we see a different emphasis, for instance, in Romans or in James, it's the scriptures. And so the way to understand the scriptures is to read everything together. Um, there is a way to reconcile all of this because any ten tensions are apparent tensions and aren't real tensions. God wouldn't give us a book that had uh, true contradictions in it. Um, you know, God wouldn't give us inspired scriptures that contradict one another. Um, there's great. Uh, this is one of the things that, for instance, if you read the... Um, um, what is it called? The Catholic Study Bible, but a different one. The one that's the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. That's it. Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. For instance, on passages like this that have been historically controversial, it has like a whole page explanation. I'm just thinking, like, I wish I could just copy that page for you. Actually, it would be great to see. Um, so, one last question. Mm -hmm. How did you, oh, how did you get into this? My my meaning is that sure. that uh, somewhere a year ago, some time back or whatever, 
it's like I really, you, you thought, I need to put this teaching together about purgatory that might have a little more mm -hmm. sense, sense than, you know, the, yeah. Im the image, the images of, of uh, people burning off their right. si burning right. off their sins and well, all that. Well, to answer stuff. that, I would just say it's something I was first introduced to in high school by a priest, actually. Um, and but it's something that I've made just kind of part of my life and an awareness of indulgences being able to get I, uh, and and how that works. And um, but you know, looking at it now, preparing this talk, especially after having studied theology for a while. Um, it's good to situate all in a context and see how it can be useful for people. And I think with any of the teachings of the church, it's also nice to see the way in which the seasonal devotions call our attention to kind of be renewed deeper within the mysteries. And, well, frankly, last month we talked about the rosary or thought about the rosary, the devotion of the rosary. November is especially dedicated to the holy souls. And so I figured why not, um, why not tell more about it. So, Father Stephen, could you give us a blessing? The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, and may he guide you by the Holy Spirit to offer your prayers and your works, especially in such a way that you may bring great benefit to yourselves and to the souls of the faithful departed through the treasury of the merits of Christ and the saints. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.